Welcome to episode four in my risk management 101 series. Today, we're gonna be diving into one of our first IT security risks, user access management. Now, identity and access management is a huge critical part of cybersecurity. In fact, it's one of the biggest risks that organizations face in this day and age. Because if you don't have a good joiners, movers, leavers, process, if you're giving out too many admin credentials to everyone, things go very wrong. So I've actually created a fictional company and I've created their systems architecture diagram just to show you how things work. So first we're gonna talk about that and highlight why this is a risk and what we can do to improve it and how to actually document it within our risk register. So let's get started. Okay, so we're going to start here with a relatively small organization. So we've got 100 people in total, 87 consultants, eight IT team members, one HR person, one finance person, and three execs, a director for operations who's in charge of consultants and the IT team, the director for HR and finance who just oversees them too, and you've got the CEO, the big bad boss. So this is how our company is set up. Now let's look at the infrastructure of the company. Now this is very simple. I've used Google Draw. I've never actually used it before. This is the first time, so forgive me for the terrible diagram. Yeah, I've used it to create two diagrams, this one and this one, and we'll be discussing the differences in a minute. So let's just assume this company has no idea about IT or security or how anything works. They've kind of scaled and grew quicker than they could even think about IT. So everyone that's joined, they've just given access to everything, literally everything. This is not uncommon in some organizations. However, not everyone would get access to everything, but you'd be surprised how many people have access to stuff that they shouldn't. So let's talk about the risks a little bit here. All the employees have access to all the HR data. So they can see each other's paychecks, they can see each other's personal health information, maybe a person's diabetic and they have to carry a EpiPen or an employee might have mental health issues that they're talking to HR about. They might have people struggling with drugs and alcohol. They might have just had to leave on bereavement leave because their parents have just passed away or something's happened to their children or whatever it may be. All that is stored within the HR application and communication between HR and the employees. Everyone has access to everything. Now, of course, we can trust and say, you know, people shouldn't be looking at other people's stuff, just use it to look at your own information, but we're not restricting this technically. That's a huge issue, of course, for obvious reasons. Another thing is HR also have access to all the business stuff. They don't need access to the Power BI database and gateway and whatnot, because essentially what the company does is they create these beautiful dashboards and analyze customers' data and they serve it back to them. HR don't need access to this underlying infrastructure. All these dashboards themselves, it's not part of their job. So we should take that away. And of course, everyone has access to the finance, the company POs, what's going in, what's coming out, bunch of stuff, big problems. IT also have unrestricted access to everything. The employees, the HR, the finance team, everyone has access to the exchange information for the email system online, everything in SharePoint, the Intune config, the intro and identity access management. They could create new users. They can grant people outside the organization access. Very bad, bad stuff. The only good thing about this is customers only have access to the Power BI online service, which they need to access their stuff and don't actually have access to internal stuff. Everything else is completely terrible. Big risk. So we've documented this in the risk register. And I'll just quickly say this is slightly exaggerated and unrealistic, but it helps us to understand the basic principles of identity and user access management. So I've created the new risk. We definitely want to mitigate it. The risk is user access management is currently lacking proper oversight, resulting in unrestricted access for all users. Another word they use is unfettered access. I like that word better. Don't know why. But anyway, this poses significant risks, including potential malicious activity, data breaches, data loss, compliance violations, reputational harm, financial set setbacks, intellectual property theft, sabotage, espionage, identity theft, operational disruptions, and lack of accountability. All very bad, 5525. Five, and our target risk score is four. Anyway, I've looked at some of the ISO 27001 controls. There's so many that we can map to help with access management. You'd be surprised how many of the controls relate to access in some way or another, even like monitoring and logging and a bunch of other things. However, I've 
I've just picked three that are quite simple and essentially this is probably the most important one 5.15 rules to control physical and logical logical meaning kind of technical access to information and other associated assets shall be established and implemented based on business and information security requirements what are those requirements the requirements of least privilege and what people need access to now there is you know the full life cycle should be managed and to be honest is a separate control where we kind of talk about the joiners movers leavers process i.e if somebody joins the organization what will they be given access to initially will that elevate after a certain time period after they finish their training or whatever and then we've got another one where access rights to information and other associated assets shall be provisioned given joining essentially when they join they're given access it'll be reviewed modified and removed in accordance with the organization's topic specific policy on rules for access control we haven't actually got a policy yet but at a high level this kind of captures of some of what we want to do so the inherent score risk probability impact is five five and i've just put a note here rbac access control to be deployed within scimitar group please reference it proposed infrastructure interesting we've got a reference to another document that i haven't shown you yet We'll get into that in a minute. Stick around. And the residual impact and residual probability risk after we've done some stuff has been lowered. But however, it's still quite high. It's still unacceptable because our target is four. So what's a proposal? This is what I am proposing. Now, I know these lines are just confusing things and it might seem like people have access to everything. However, ignore the lines per se and just focus on this bit on the right. Now, of course, I could have worded this a lot better but it doesn't matter it gets a point across so let's take these one by one now role based access control rbac popular term you have to know about it in cyber security it's the easiest way to administer access instead of somebody new joining the company and you individually giving them access to very specific things and saying okay they need access to this that and this what role do they hold are they a consultant or are they part of the finance team or are they the IT team? If so, let's just copy their profile, their access profile or insert them into a specific group or role now you can use microsoft entra you can use into i'm sure the hr applications have a bunch of stuff they can do there's so many different ways we're not going to get technical on how this is done we're just focusing on the concept the concept is we're creating a few different roles within the organization five to be precise the it admin is essentially king of the castle he has access to everything now typically you do have a it admin a domain admin who is essentially has access to everything these types of accounts need to be very restricted and even what's funny is the it admin should actually have a normal user account that just has access to email and browsing and he only elevates his privilege to the it admin account when he needs to do an administrative activity change a configuration setting create a new user for someone they should not be browsing the web with their domain admin account we can add restrictions to this but we're not going to get into that it's just worth understanding that even the it team the admins the domain admins the admins of the internal corporate network whatever it may be those admin accounts are separate accounts that are only used for administrative activities because if they're logged into one of those accounts they click on a malicious link they open a malicious file their admin account is compromised However, if they have a normal IT user account, which is just browsing email and that account gets compromised, there's less of an impact on the rest of the infrastructure. So we've just added a new role here. We won't add it there, but you get the point. So HR have access to the HR admin and they administer the application. And so does IT. Because this organization is so small, it's probably not clever just to have one person being the sole admin for something, just in case something goes wrong or they're sick or they get hit by a car or whatever may happen. You know, you have a kind of backup in place. You could, of course, contact the vendor and get that sorted another way. But anyway, they need access to the admin stuff of the HR so they can see everything and they've also got their own profile. However, everybody else only has access to their specific profile for themselves, i.e. they can access the HR application to look at their own profile 
their own personal development plan, their own salary, their own emergency contact number, but they can't see everybody else's. So you can only see two lines going here, the one IT admin and the HR, which is great. Now the normal IT users, i.e. if you look at the organizational chart, maybe the operations director is the IT admin, or you have a specific IT admin from here. But anyway, the IT team does need access to quite a lot. They need access to Microsoft Azure, Intune, Microsoft Entra, SharePoint, Exchange Online, maybe not the Power BI service because let's assume the consultants actually control it and do everything there. Now finance, the finance team, the finance person literally only needs access to the finance application server. They don't need access to anything else, of course the database too, but anything else in the organization, they typically don't need access. However, we do need them to be connected to Microsoft services because they will have a SharePoint, they will have their identity technical controls enforced through Intune for their laptop and a bunch of other things. So of course that is there, but ideally the finance application server and the database is primarily what they'll be working out of. So there'll be a specific whitelist rule for that person's home static IP address that gives them access to the server and database and nothing else within the corporate network. And the cloud estate will be very restricted to their own SharePoint if they wanna back up and upload stuff. Should have added OneDrive here as well, but that's fine. So yeah, restricted to them. If anyone joins a finance team, they'll be given access to this too, but they won't need access to anything else. Now the consultants are primarily the SharePoint and Power BI stuff here. So it's kind of this part and also the SharePoint bit, but they don't need access to anything else other than their own HR profile as well. So that's all cool, that's there. The IT admin of course has access to everything, but has a separate account. And the firewall, this baby over here is our kind of central piece that's managing a lot of this. Mainly within the corporate network, it's denying all traffic that's not explicitly allowed through. And this will be based on each person's individual home IP address. Now, of course, there are other ways to do this, but let's keep it simple. The finance person has an IP address of whatever it is, and the firewall is allowing traffic from that IP address to reach the application server and finance database. Every other IP address, anything else is denied automatically. And it's the same with all the other roles. So you get the point. Now on Microsoft services in the cloud estate, this is controlled slightly differently because primarily here we've got Microsoft Entra, Intune, and Entra is primarily the identity service for Microsoft. They change the names every other day. I wouldn't be surprised if next week there's a completely new name for how they manage and control identity. And what's also important to say is that this is kind of our proposed thing to create these roles and profiles. There's some stuff that will be, need to be done on the firewall to restrict access to just individual people, to specific parts of their corporate network. There's also some stuff that will need to be done within the cloud estate, both in the HR software and in the Microsoft services. However, this is very restricted. Now, if for whatever reason, the consultant has been hacked, their whole PC system, whatever is compromised, their individual emails, their individual files stored locally will of course be compromised. The hacker will only have access to the Power BI stuff, maybe be some SharePoint stuff and their HR profile, but won't have access to all the employees data and will not have access to the company's finances. So we've restricted the blast radius of that attack to one area of the business still bad but it's not as bad as the other diagram where they just have access to everything so that's our proposed solution our proposed solution is to deploy role-based access control to mitigate this risk and hopefully that's helped to give you an understanding of the problems with user access control. Now, another big problem here is one, we don't have an access policy. So this is a bit of a problem. This is not documented. It's not coming as a directive enforcement from the top down. Ideally, the CEO needs to tell the IT team, needs to tell the organization we're making changes. Another thing is it doesn't have to map across to ISO 27001. It can be NIST. 3.1 access control. I know they've got a more specific one on role-based access control as well. So there's kind of enhancements we can do and a bunch of other things. So this is just very basic. Let's control the access. However, let's just think about this a bit deeper now.
The consultants could be working on specific projects or specific clients. So let's say every client has five consultants working on it and that's their full-time job and they don't cross over or touch anyone else. Why not create a bunch of client specific data within the database or within Power BI and restrict the permissions even further so they can only access their own client's data that they're working on as opposed to every single client. Let's say you had more than one finance team member and you had one in charge for kind of payroll and like overtime and reimbursements and whatever else. They might have access to a specific portion of the finance application server or database but they don't need to have access to what the customers are paying them and the financial forecast for the next quarter or the next year. That might be restricted to the finance director and the CEO. The IT team might have different roles. You might have one of the IT team responsible for just Intu and they create compliance and configuration policies for end users and help out with desktop support. So their access might be restricted to just Intu and nothing else. You know, you might have someone who's just in charge of the Exchange Online server and they're access is restricted to just that so even within roles we can also create groups or create more granular roles to restrict access even further now of course I haven't captured all of this in the risk but this is a kind of next level of what we can do but first let's get the basics in place let's not overcomplicate things i'm just letting you know that this can be even deeper and better but for now, we're just going to keep it simple, very high level. And this is kind of the worst level of risk management you can do. But it's a very good introduction into what this looks like in a company and how these decisions are made. But in reality, you're probably starting here and then you're moving more granular to what I just described where one IT team member should only access Intune because that's all they do. Another IT team member is in charge for exchange. We'll restrict it from there. Two finance people. One's responsible for payroll and reimbursements of stuff people have spent. And the other person helps with looking after customer POs and financial forecasting and whatever else. Maybe the third person who looks at operational and capital expenditure and that's their responsibility. You get the point. You can, of course, restrict this even further and further. And the whole thing is principle of least privilege, the least amount of access they need to do their job and need to know. Only give them them access to stuff they really need to know for their job and nothing more so yeah links to these will be in the description and i want to see you building on this this is not good enough this is just some basic stuff i've put in place and proposed so let's see how you can make this better Now there's so much more to user access management. We didn't even talk about the policy. We didn't even talk about the joiners, movers and leavers process. Having that refined, maybe automated. Let's say a finance team member decided they wanted to change career and move into IT. If they move across the organization, will they still have access to the finance server? and the finance application. And this is one of the biggest problems you have in large complex organizations. As people move across the organization and they've been there 20 or 30 years and they've done so many different roles, they tend to have access to a lot more than they need to. Because often when they move, there isn't a process in place to actually review their access they had and think, now what do they need access to? It's just that instead of all of that stuff. It's called privilege creep. So yeah, a bunch of important things I hope you've learned today from this video. And just remember, you need to build on this now. I want you to create more detailed risk descriptions, better control descriptions, better notes, capture this in a more comprehensive way in the risk register. And if you can, get more granular, create specific restrictions above and beyond beyond what we've just done. We've just gone from everybody having access to everything to a few different roles, but it can be better than that. So let's see what you can do. If you've enjoyed this and you're enjoying the series so far, then please like, comment, share, and subscribe. Show the channel some love over and out, and I will see you in the next one.